All right, so we are picking up sensation in the retina. Uh, and the one thing I want to try and point out, which is a little difficult to do with this slide, is the pathway that light is going to take through the retina. So if you imagine that like this part right here is here, so this is like the back of the eye and the pupil would be down here somewhere, right? Light is coming this way. So you've got three different cell layers in your retina, ganglion cells, bipolar cells, whoop, and photoreceptors, your rods and cones. And the light has to pass through the ganglion cells and the bipolar cells before it can hit your photoreceptors. And the photoreceptive parts of the photoreceptors, um, so the region of the cell that actually contains the photoreceptive pigments, is down here. So in this slide over here, again, light is coming from this direction, and light passes past these nuclei here, which are your ganglion cells, the nuclei here of your bipolar cells, and past the nuclei of all of your photoreceptive cells. So this dark layer here is all of these nuclei there, because they're dense and dark. And this layer right here, um, that's the part of your retina that actually detects light. Um, so the light is going to pass through all of this and not affect anything. It just passively gets past the ganglion cells and the bipolar cells. And it's not until it hits the photoreceptive regions of the photoreceptors that you get transduction. Um, it's just sort of an interesting thing to point out if you know, the, it appears as though your eye is kind of built backwards. It would work a lot better if your photoreceptors were here, right? And that was the first thing that light hits, but that's not how it evolved. This is how it happened. And having this is better than not having an eye. So eyes exist, even though they're not built as well as they could be. Um, so you want to know the basics of rods versus cones. First, we will talk about the rods. They're called rods because they're rod shaped. Um, there is only one photoreceptor in your rods. So rods cannot differentiate between different wavelengths or different colors of light. They simply know whether or not light is hitting them. So the image from rods is black and white or grayscale image. They are very sensitive to light. So they work good at night. But this is why your night vision doesn't have very good color, because it's your rods. Um, and also, the image that your rods produced is not as distinct as the image that comes from your cones. So if you just look here at these three rods, they all communicate to the same ganglion cell. And that ganglion cell there is the output to the brain. So that's what the brain hears from. That's what the brain knows in terms of what's going on in the retina. So if light hits here, here, or there, the brain thinks it's all the same thing. So you don't get um, high resolution information coming from your rods because they communicate as a group to the ganglion cells. And it's the ganglion cell that is the output to your central nervous system. So let's contrast that then with cones. You have three different cones, red, green, and blue, that respond to different wavelengths of light. Um, so here is your blue, green, and red cones. And then your rods just respond to that one uh, band wavelength of light going back. Um, so they cones are responsible for your sense of color. Um, they are not as sensitive as your rods, so you need bright light for your cones. Again, this is why you don't see color very well when it's dark, just different shades of gray. Um, now because they have what I call non-converging pathways, or a more direct line of communication to the ganglion cells, you get a higher resolution image. And the picture we have of the retina doesn't show this very well because it's only got, excuse me for the creaking, but the headphones hurt after a while. Um, this picture only has a couple of cones in it, 
but if every one of these photoreceptors were a cone, you would see that each cone has a one-to-one -one line of communication with a ganglion cell, which again is the output to the brain. So if all of these were cones, every point on your retina that light could strike would be interpreted differently by your brain because it would be information coming from a different ganglion cell. So this is why your day vision and your color vision is sharper than your night vision and it's why the center of your field of view is sharper than your peripheral vision because your peripheral vision relies more heavily on rods. Um, later on we will talk about what the macula lutea and the fovea centralis are. Just for now know that they exist and there's lots of cones there. This we already talked about. Oh here we are. We're there already. So the first thing we want to talk about is the macula. Um, in this picture here, right, it's the whole region. So you want to just imagine that all of this is the macula lutea. And that is where there are more cones than rods. So all of the light information that hits part of your retina is producing a sharper image than would be produced by other parts of your retina. Then in the very middle of your macula lutea is your fovea centralis um, and here you can see that the nuclei of the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells is pushed off to the side so now there's less stuff in the way in between the light which is going to come from this way and your photoreceptors which are down here. So your fovea is the middle, middle portion of your field of view. It is what you're looking directly at. And that is the part of the world which you can see most clearly. Yeah. So just know those. Uh, then a few more things about the retina. Um, we've already sort of mentioned that it is your ganglion cells that are the output from your brain. So just imagine there's a whole bunch of ganglion cells here and then collectively their axons all stream across the retina and out the back of the eye. So here where you have your optic disc it's all axons there are no photoreceptors here, so no little blue lines that I drew in that are supposed to look like photoreceptors. That's why the optic disc is called your blind spot, because there are no photoreceptors there. Um, in the lab, we're going to have a little activity which will make apparent to you the existence of your blind spot. But there, there is a part of the world for each of your eyes that your brain does not get information on or your eyes do not detect. Um, so electrophysiology of rods is kind of complicated. I've tried to make it as simple as possible. The first thing you want to know is that rods are kind of opposite to how we generally think nerves working. Um, in the absence of light, when it is dark out, when the rod is not being stimulated, it automatically depolarizes. Um, so it's like the autorhythmic cells in your heart, which you don't know about because we haven't done heart yet. Good job, Dr. Ayanna Cohn. Um, sorry. Um, so it, they, they are default depolarized, releasing a steady stream of neurotransmitter. When light hits the rod, that causes it to hyperpolarize and it stops releasing neurotransmitter. So it's exactly the opposite of how we normally think of neurons you stimulate it and it releases neurotransmitter. These guys shut off when you release neurotransmitter. Um, and why it is that way we don't need to get into because then it just makes the retina even more complicated and we don't need to overcomplicate things. Uh, oh, it just occurred to me that, whoops, I was going to try and fix, there we go, my whatever you call that. The screen that I was recording through was not lined up well. Um, 
So we're still now talking about rods and are going to talk about the biochemistry or the chemistry of how rods work. Um, inside of all of your rods are these stacks of membrane that have a pigment um, signaling molecule embedded in the membrane of called rhodopsin. Rhodopsin you want to know is composed of two different things, a protein, opsin, and a chemical retinol. So this blue barbell looking thing or dumbbell looking thing is the opsin and what looks like that little magenta key there is the retinol. Now, the retinol comes in two different shapes, trans and cis. We don't really care about the shape. I am not going to ask you when it is trans or when it is cis, which one has this bend in it here and which one is straight. You just want to know that it comes in two different shapes. I may mention trans and cis, but I won't ask you to differentiate between them on an exam. Um, so in the dark, um, operational rhodopsin has the opsin with the bent trans retinol in it. When light hits it, energy from the light causes a chemical rearrangement that causes the retinol to straighten out. It then falls out of the little binding pocket that it normally fits into. This activates the opsin. Um, so in the next slide we're going to go over what it means to be a G protein. You don't have to worry about the details. I just want you to be familiar with it because it's something that's going to come up again in the next chapter and I want you to be able to envision what's going on so that things make sense. Um, so light hits the rhodopsin. The opsin lets go of the retinol. This activates the G protein pathway which hyperpolarizes or shuts off the rod momentarily and then the retinol has to be converted back to the cis form before you can reconstitute rhodopsin. So this is what it looks like. Again, more detail than you need to know, but here is your rhodopsin, the purple opsin and the magenta retinol. Light hits it, retinol gets released, um, and then it's kind of like um, a Rube Goldberg machine or an old arcade pinball machine where stuff bounces around in the membrane and that's going to cause an ion channel to close and then the depolarizing sodium current is no longer coming in and the rod's going to hyperpolarize. Um, so I just want you to think of G proteins as being um, I can't even come up with the words to describe it. It'll make more sense when we do um, the endocrine system because I have more slides to explain it. Um, but you want to think of it as like this interchangeable cell signaling mechanism where you have a G protein here and then other stuff can be embedded in the membrane waiting for it to become activated and you can get lots of different effects on the cell physiology following stimulation of a G protein receptor. Um, the other thing I want to point out, I want you to understand this because it is going to make light adaptation and dark adaptation easier to understand. Um, so you want to understand that this part happens really fast. So light hits the opsin, or excuse me, the rhodopsin, and the retinol leaves freeing the opsin. That's super quick. Um, and under very bright light, all of the rhodopsin can be bleached out like this, where it's opsin without the retinol. And then this part happens slowly. Um, so again, in bright light, because this happens faster than that, you can have rods that fail to accumulate enough of the rhodopsin to activate this G protein pathway sufficiently. Um, so even though there's light hitting the rod, it's acting like it's in the dark because its G protein pathways are all bleached out or its rhodopsin is all bleached out. You want to think of the rods as having to have a minimum number of these molecules ready to go 
so that you can close enough of these channels to actually change the electrophysiology of the cell. If you only have a few of these lying around, you're not going to close enough of these channels to change the membrane potential, and the rod's not going to respond to the light that hits it. So, um, oh, that's right, I was going to move something. Doesn't matter, we'll just keep plowing through stuff. Um, you want to know then that the cones work pretty much the same way, um, but yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Cones work the same way. I'm oversimplifying things, but that's what introductory classes do. Uh, so then we move on to light adaptation versus dark adaptation. And this is where we want to remember how rhodopsin works. Um, so light adaptation is like you're, you're lying in bed, it's dark in the room in the morning, and somebody walks in, spouse, parent, whatever, and turns on the light. All of a sudden, your eyes are exposed to bright light. So because it's dark out, your rods are just sitting there waiting to go with lots of rhodopsin. The bright light hits your rods and you get overstimulation of your retina, which your brain interprets as glare. Your pupils are going to constrict and in a very short period of time, your rods are going to run out of rhodopsin. So they're going to be like this here, all opsin, not enough reformed rhodopsin. So they're going to function as if they're in the dark. Your cones are fine. So as soon as the glare or the neurological after image goes away, your visual acuity improves relatively quickly in just a couple of minutes. Dark adaptation, right? This is now the opposite. It's night. You're getting ready to go to bed. You turn off the light in what was previously a brightly lit bedroom um, and you can't see Jack. Um, it's too dark in the room for your cones to function and the light was just on and your rods are all bleached out so neither of your photoreceptors are working very well. You can't see anything, your pupils dilate, it's going to take 20 to 30 minutes for your vision to come back online because you have to reform all of your rhodopsin. So again we're at this part now because this is slow it takes a long time for you to adjust to the dark because when you go from light to dark your rods are all in this state here without any rhodopsin. Um, these are or I should say there are open-ended questions on the exam about this. I don't ask you to explain completely dark adaptation versus light adaptation but you can expect questions about you know why your rods don't work why dark adaptation takes longer than light adaptation, um, and what happens to the pupils going from dark for dark adaptation and light adaptation. So um, smaller, more focused essay questions that aren't explaining the whole process of dark adaptation or light adaptation. Um, the visual pathway, again, this is not open-ended, so you just want to remember your ganglion cells are the output from your eye. They form the optic nerve. Um, so all of these axons here coming out of your eye, I went too far, it should stop right here. Um, whoops, stop there. Uh, those axons are the axons of your ganglion cells. They form your optic nerve. Your optic nerve projects to your thalamus so thalamus here and thalamus there and then other neurons called your optic radiation project from the thalamus back to the cerebral cortex so that's that part there so it's your ganglion cells in red and your optic radiation cells in blue with your thalamus being where they meet um, offshoots again not essay questions. Your visual pathway is kind of complicated. Um, you have nuclei or control centers in your midbrain and your medulla which are responsible for visual reflexes. Um, so controlling your iris, eye movement, ciliary muscle, all of that. Uh, and then your hypothalamus is aware of how much daylight you're exposed to because that controls your sleep-wake cycles which we'll talk about in the endocrine system. So it's uh, melatonin that helps you fall asleep 
and the part of your brain that releases melatonin has to be told how much light you're being exposed to and it's the hypothalamus that does that. Um, depth perception you can just read about. I never ask questions about it. Now we are on to sound. Uh, it was 20 minutes. Hopefully sound won't take much longer than 20 minutes and I hope you're not listening to these screencasts the whole way through because it would be mind-numbing to listen to me for 40 minutes without taking a break. Um, so please remember to take breaks, do something different, um, have a cup of coffee or something, uh, but break up your day. All right, properties of sound. So sound travels in waves. They're compression waves, but they're very similar to the standing waves that you would see on the ocean or a lake. Um, you want to know that pitch is frequency, so high notes have high frequency, low notes have low frequency and then amplitude equals volume. This should just make sense, right? A larger wave like this blue one when it crashes on the beach is going to make a louder sound than a smaller wave. Um, and the physics are exactly the same. Bigger waves have more energy um, and they disturb your ear more just the same way big waves crashing on the beach have more energy. Okay, so now this is just sort of an overview. Um, I will say that how I normally teach this when it's an in-person class, there's a great big 10-point essay question about how the ear works, and the PowerPoints are set up to give you this big long explanation. That is not how online exams are going to work. We're going to break it up into smaller bits, again, so that you're not typing complete paragraphs. Um, but just to give you the overview, your outer ear is responsible for collecting the sound and then it funnels it into your middle ear. Your middle ear is going to transduce the vibrations through those three bones called the ossicles to your inner ear. Along the way the vibrations get amplified so it actually increases the force of the vibrations. And then your inner ear or your cochlea really is responsible for transducing the sound or turning it into changes in membrane potential. So let me just move the frame. I don't know why the slide moves, but there we are. Uh, so again, this is just overview. Sound wave is collected by your outer ear. Um, and then the first thing it's going to hit is the tympanic membrane. And what we're going to kind of do as we go through the slides is trace the pathway of vibrations because your hearing is very much mechanical. Um, many steps along the way is just one thing causes something else to vibrate which causes something else to vibrate and we don't get to anything that looks like physiology until the very last step. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is the anatomy of the parts that get vibrated and not a lot of physiology. So you're going to have to Bear with me so that we understand the anatomy, because without understanding the anatomy, we don't get the physiology of how the ear works. Um, so sound waves hit your tympanic membrane, um, which is then going to transmit vibrations to your three ossicles there. So this is now your middle ear. Um, mechanically, we are right here. Um, and the ossicles are going to amplify the amount of pressure that is transmitted to your inner ear. Right, so in a minute or two, we're going to try and make sense of the anatomy of your inner ear. For now, I just want you to know that on the other side of your middle ear is a fluid-filled chamber that is embedded in bone. So think of it like a drum where the head of the drum is flexible, but the walls of the drum are not. They're wood or metal or whatever. Um, so the head of the drum in this analogy here is what is called the oval window. This is the flexible membrane that opens onto or encloses um, the fluid filled chambers of your inner ear. Um, so sound waves hit your tympanic membrane causing it to vibrate. The vibrations are then transferred from the malleus to the incus then the stapes and the stapes is going to vibrate the oval window which will then send vibrations into your inner ear. 
this is one of your open-ended questions. I want you to be able to explain to me how amplification works or how your middle ear works. So sound vi uh, vibrations vibrate your tympanic membrane, which then vibrates malleus, incus, stapes, transmitting the vibrations to the oval window. There are two mechanisms here that make the amplification process work. The first one is the second bullet point here. It's simply the amount of leverage. So you can see that the ossicles are kind of long, or at least the malleus and the incus are. So that amplifies the pressure because of the leverage that is imparted to the ossicles. The other reason why more force gets applied to the oval window than sound applies to your tympanic membrane is because of the difference in the size of the two membranes. And to understand this, you have to understand how pressure works and how pressure is measured. Um, so if I ask you, what tire pressure are you running in your car? You might say 35 PSI or 30 PSI. And the PSI stands for pounds per square inch, right? So when we're measuring pressure, it's force per unit area, square inch. If you have a big area, like your tympanic membrane, and you transmit all of the pressure, plus more because of the leverage here, to a smaller area, then the force per unit area is even bigger. Um, so you're taking all of the force that's hitting a big area applying the same amount of force now to a smaller area that means the force per unit area goes up all right and i just had to switch to slideshow or presenter view so i can click through um, this slide because different parts of it fall into place um, i just want you to understand the anatomy of your cochlea so that the physiology makes more sense this is not something that you need to be able to explain but I like for people to be able to understand things. So first thing you want to understand is that your cochlea is embedded in your temporal bone. So all of this stuff here that's yellow is bone. And here where it says sagittal view, you want to imagine you're looking into somebody's ear, like when the doctor looks in your ear with a little otoscope. Only imagine that your tympanic membrane and ossicles are removed. So you're just looking at the wall of your temporal bone that is hiding your cochlea. And then the frontal view would be like if you, you know, removed somebody's eye and cut through the temporal bone and were looking at it through the eye socket, sort of like that. Um, so everything is bone. Inside of the bone is a big fluid filled chamber. Um, this is your cochlea. I have it just stretched out flat, right? But in reality, it's all kind of wound up um, into a cinnamon bun like that. But again, we have it flat. So this chamber is filled with a fluid called perilymph. Um, then, whoops, let's just say. Uh, so then you want to imagine that you cut through the bone here so you can just see what the chambers of the cochlea look like cut in cross section. It would start out looking like this. You have this circular chamber. Then there's another chamber embedded in that bigger chamber. This is filled with a different fluid called endolymph. That's the green. And the membrane that encloses this space is flexible. Both top and bottom are somewhat flexible, but they have different names. And we'll get into that. Um, so then again, if you looked in somebody's ear and looked at this from the side, it would look like this. This is what this inner chamber would look like. And then there are flexible membranes again that enclose both ends of this chamber. So on top, that's your oval window, and then below it is your round window. So if you were to, again, remove tympanic membrane and your ossicles, you'd be able to see your oval window and the round window. So when we look at this picture here, it looks like your cochlea has three different chambers, um, and they're called scala vestibuli, cochlear duct or scala media and scala tympani 
but these two in blue are really two different sections of the same tube and it begins at the oval window and ends at the round window both of which are flexible membranes and then everything around it all of this is bone so that's inflexible um, so what happens then right uh, your stapes vibrates your oval window sound waves are amplified that causes the fluid in your scala vestibuli which is perilymph um, to vibrate as well so it's almost like waves on a pond or something um, those vibrations travel through the cochlea so down the scala vestibuli around the end there which is called the helicotrema but i'm never going to ask you about that um, and then they hit the round window so the round window is flexible so that when your stapes pushes in on your oval window your round window will bulge out and that allows the vibrations to travel more efficiently through the perilymph in your cochlea um, so we're going to skip this slide or yeah we're just going to skip it because you don't have to do uh, again, this slide is for when I'm teaching in person and people have to explain from beginning to end the whole thing in paragraph form, but we're not going to do that. Um, so those sound waves that you do not hear, uh, let me go back, does it say that? Um, doesn't matter. Sound waves that you do not hear don't disturb anything in the middle, any of this stuff, um, as they pass through your ear those sounds that you can hear frequencies that you are capable of detecting cause this bottom membrane here called the bacillar membrane to vibrate at different locations and so now we need to zoom in and understand the anatomy of the stuff that's inside of your cochlear duct um, so the structure that is responsible for transducing sound is called the organ of corti. Um, it's the bacillar membrane plus the stuff that's sitting on top of it, hair cells and tectorial membrane. Um, so let me move on to the next page, right? So if we go, right, what I showed you, this right here is now in full anatomical detail this right here and we're going to zoom in and talk about the organ of corti remembering that sound waves are traveling through this fluid here and are going to cause the bacillar membrane here to move because the fluid underneath it is vibrating um, so here's your bacillar membrane here um, that's going to move up and down, which is going to push the hair cells up towards this thing here, um, your tectorial membrane. Your tectorial membrane is relatively stiff, um, so when your hair cells get pushed up, that is going to cause your hairs to bend. Um, whoops, I'm going to come back to that slide. You'll see why it's there in a second. Um, so again bacillar membrane is here um, it gets pushed up the hairs get pushed into the tectorial membrane which is relatively stiff this causes your hair cells to bend here um, and when the hairs bend that opens that little channel there um, that allows uh, an ion like sodium to rush in and depolarize the cell um, so the second kind of essay question I might ask you is how does transduction work or how does your inner ear work? And in a nutshell, it's this slide here, which I copied and pasted from a couple slides ago, and this. So I want you to be able to tell me that the oval window transmits vibrations to the perilymph. Um, the perilymph is going to cause the bacillar membrane to move or vibrations in the perilymph cause vibrations in the bacillar membrane which pushes the hair cells up into the tectorial membrane causing the channels to open and ions to flow in 
Um, you don't have to name the ions, just be able to describe that brief little how does your inner ear work question. So there's going to be two questions or two possible open-ended questions on the exam. I will also say that everything in the objectives that's listed as a possible open-ended question will not be on the exam, um, or there would be too many open-ended questions, but they're all, they all potentially could be, so you need to know them all. Um, so we had one question about how amplification works, um, and then the other question about how transduction works or how your inner ear works. So those are the open-ended questions you can expect to find. Um, we can go over this real quick. If you were in an in-person class and writing an essay question, this would be the totality of how hearing works, where your outer ear um, collects and funnels the sound waves towards your middle ear. Um, sound waves are going to cause your tympanic membrane to vibrate, which is going to transmit vibrations to the malleus the incus, and then the stapes. These vibrations will be amplified and transferred to the oval window, which will then cause pressure waves in the perilymph in your scala vestibuli. When your scala vestibuli moves, that is going to cause vibrations in your bacillar membrane, which pushes the hairs up into the tectorial membrane, causing the hair cells to bend depolarizing the hair cell and causing the release of neurotransmitter. That's all of hearing from beginning to end. And it's all vibrations in anatomy until you get to that last little part where a channel pops open. Um, so then pitch, we won't spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, so you want to know that different parts of your bacillar membrane have a different structure where it's stiffer in some sections and floppier in other sections. Um, the stiff sections resonate with high frequencies and the floppier sections resonate with low frequencies. Um, so the perception of pitch is dependent upon which region of your bacillar membrane your auditory cortex is getting information from. Um, if you click on this, this takes you to a YouTube video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, um, which is a sort of large-scale demonstration of the same phenomenon where something will vibrate when it is exposed to vibrations that match its natural vibratory wavelength. Um, the analogy I use is if you have two pianos on stage, um, next to each other. If you hit middle C on piano one, the middle C string on the second piano will start to vibrate because it resonates when it's exposed to the sound that it would make if it were vibrating. And that's what your bacillar membrane does. The different parts of your bacillar membrane will resonate with different frequencies and this is how your brain knows which frequencies are hitting your bacillar membrane. I'm not going to ask you any questions about the auditory pathway because it's too darn complicated. So you have a bunch of different auditory reflexes so that both your eyes and your head um, respond to loud sounds and that's why you have pit stops at the midbrain and the thalamus and the medulla but who cares. Um, so now we're on to equilibrium. We have two different kinds of equilibrium which we'll talk about. We're going to have two different structures that help detect changes in those equilibrium. So first up is your static equilibrium. Um, this has to do with changes in linear acceleration. Um, so this is start, stop, left or right, um, and also the position of your head. Um, so if you tilt your head forward, neurologically this is the same thing as slowing down in your car. The structure that detects changes in static equilibrium is called the macula. So this is one macula, plural they are the maculae. You have two of them located in your vestibule. So one for stop-start, one for left-right. 
the structure of your macula looks like this. Um, you have a bunch of hair cells. The hair cells have hairs coming off of them. Um, they're called stereocilia, but who cares? And I'm not going to ask you about the biggest, longest hair called the kinocilium, because that doesn't matter. Um, so you have these hair cells. On top of the hairs is what is called the otolithic membrane. It has these little calcium carbonate stones embedded in it called otoliths that give it more weight. So if you've ever heard anybody said, I have rocks in my ears, this is why, because you do have these little calcium bicarbonate or calcium carbonate stones. So the way it works is that if you are moving at a constant speed, so this means sitting at a stoplight or 75 miles an hour with the cruise control on, we're detecting changes in velocity, acceleration or deceleration, not speed. Um, so constant velocity, you are moving at a same velocity and your otolithic membrane is moving along with you. So your hair cells are straight up and down and you've got a steady stream of neurotransmitter being released by your hair cells onto the fibers of your vestibular nerve. If you, like in this picture here, slam on the brakes in your car, um, you're going to stop real quick. Your otolithic membrane is going to slide forward the same way beverages slosh around in, a, in your coffee cup when you're driving. So when that otolithic membrane slides forward, that's going to bend the hairs. And then the hairs are either going to hyperpolarize or depolarize, and that's going to change the amount of neurotransmitter they release. Um, so you don't have to know whether acceleration causes depolarization or hyperpolarization. You just need to know that changes in static equilibrium change your, your membrane potential, which changes the amount of neurotransmitter that's released. Um, so again, zero miles an hour constant or 75 miles an hour or 300 when you're on a plane constant velocity, constant stream of neurotransmitter. Speed up or slow down changes the rate of neurotransmitter release. Um, so then you have your cristae ampullaris. These are the receptors for dynamic equilibrium. This is rotation. Um, so you have three different semicircular canals, one, two, three, because you have three different axes of rotation. So think, you know, you can do uh, like a chair spin, um, like the figure skaters do when they just like spin around. You can do a front flip or a back flip or a cartwheel. Um, so flips, cartwheels, spins, those are your X, Y, Z axes of rotation and why you have three different semicircular canals. Um, so the cristae ampullaris are located in these bulges at the base of your semicircular canals called ampulla. Again, you have hair cells that have a gelatinous membrane on top of them. This is called the cupola. So if you are sitting still or rotating at some constant velocity, um, you and your hair cells are all moving at the same speed and the fluid in your semicircular canals is moving along with you. If you were to suddenly start moving, like rotate your head, right? your head is going to move quickly, your ear, your inner ear is going to move along with you, but the fluid in your semicircular canal is going to remain still and you're basically dragging your um, cupola through this fluid, which hasn't started moving with you that yet, that bends the cupola, bends the hair cells, and alters their neurotransmitter release rate. So it's just like with the macula, constant rotation or no rotation is constant stream of neurotransmitter. Changes in rotation lead to more or less neurotransmitter. And that's it. Just under 45 minutes you are done with sensation. Next up, endocrine system.